All right, so we are recording. <laughs> so we so welcome to Jules Poetry Playhouse, those of you who have not been here before. And um, we it's just a wonderful view and we do a lot of writing classes and readings and this is the first in person reading we've had probably since last summer. <laughs> so, so yeah, welcome. And Margaret wanted to read at the Playhouse. So I'm so happy to have her here. She's a, a friend as well as, um, I'll let you read her bio on the website and most of you know her anyway. <laughs> so, but um, poet, activist and friend and kind of a like a godmother to John and I because it was because of her that we met in Albuquerque. So you can, well, you can ask us later about that story. <laughs> but yeah, um, if, if we had to read Margaret's bio, we'd be yeah, here all we'd be here all day. So, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, she'll be reading from her book, uh, Storm Clouds, Like Unkept Promises. And we'll be selling books afterwards as well as art. And we're so great to have Barbara here as well. Yeah. So um, I will let Barbara get started. Barbara. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't had coffee. They're, you you both are kind of like a couple and merged we're into not, my mind. We're not kind of like a couple, we're a couple. You're a couple that your names are interchanged in my mind. Right. Okay. This is an absolutely extraordinary audience. I'm just, um, can you hear me? Uh, I'm so thrilled to see all of you because of course, um, I guess the person I know longest is my brother, John. Um, but then uh, by proxy, Lisa Goldman, whose father was a good friend in the 40s and 50s. Um, and, uh, you know, so many familiar faces, Gary and, and Esther and um, uh, my dear friends, uh, Mary Ann and, and uh, Rosemary and, I don't want to keep, uh, of course, um, uh, Lenore and um, uh, Larry. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just the old age uh, creeping in. I don't want to keep on because then I'll do that more and more, just forget people. But um, I think what, what moves me so much about this audience is how many of you are creative people yourselves, writers and artists. and. Um, people who appreciate poetry. And I want to say before I start how much I appreciate um, uh, Jules and John, because um, you've really created something. Thank you. You've, you've really created something extraordinary here. I remember when Jules first came uh, from Minneapolis. How many years ago? Uh, 11. 11. And it seems like in some ways, it seems like yesterday. It's, in some ways, it seems like she's been here forever. But I don't think I've ever met anyone who came to a new place and more quickly just decided to throw herself into cultural work and did it so successfully. And then, of course, when John joined her, um, it became uh, like a double effort, which uh, has produced so many books and workshops and readings. Um, it's just great to be here. Uh, as Jules said, uh, this book, uh, Storm Clouds Like Unkept Promises, is a joint effort uh, by me and by my wife, Barbara Byers, who's a visual artist. Um, we don't uh, usually think of ourselves as illustrating one another's work, uh, but we work together. We've been together for almost 36 years. And as two artists living in the same space, our work sort of naturally nurtures each other. So very often in our relationship, it's turned out that um, she's done art that I've wanted to write about, or she's, or I've written poems and then noticed that some of her paintings or, or photographs work really well with them. And that's sort of what happened with this book. Um, so the book has black and white photographs by Barbara and poems by me that don't illustrate one another, but I think complement one another. And um, there is, uh, I think, a couple or two or three uh, hardbacks um, of the book available inside and uh, a number of, of uh, soft covers and another little 
poetry chapbook, bilingual poetry chapbook by myself. All of these um, produced by a wonderful new publishing company in Northern New Mexico in Abiquiu called Casa Oraca Press. So I wanna sort of give a shout out also to Zach Hively, who's the director of that press and has done a great job uh, bringing good poetry books to fruition here. I'm just gonna read um, a few poems from the book. And then, you know, if you wanna have a conversation, that would be fine. And I'll sign books for people and Barbara will too. So, um, the first po uh, poem I'm going to read is called Every Death, An Act of Survival. And it's for Sister Diana Ortiz, 1958 to 2021. Sister Diana Ortiz died today and yesterday and every day since that monstrous death 32 years ago, every death, an act of survival. The men who stubbed 100 cigarettes out on her back and raped her would have said if asked, they were good Christians fighting communism. The horrors she endured do not belong in a poem and can only be told in a poem. Suspension over an open pit where dead and living bodies wiped her memory of all she'd known before. They forced her to kill and filmed her as she did, abuse enough to break an army of angels justified by their need of a weapon to keep her in their line of fire. Foul words describing foul acts are painful to hear, but we must hear them, absorb them, understand what is done in the name of all who would hide such truths. Word got out, worldwide clamor for her release, and suddenly an American was there taking her away in his car, afraid he would kill her. She managed to escape. Later, she thought the mysterious man might have been there all along, directing the others. Later, there was abortion. Later, there was madness. Unable to recognize her family or the sisters in her order, near failure to function in this blinded world that refuses to look or listen, years of agony relived yet telling her story each time it was needed, years that brought fresh deaths and misplaced shame. You don't heal from such terror without necessity's embrace. You don't heal from it in each successive death and certainly not in a poem. Diana dies in this poem and also lives in it. The Ursuline's nun and teacher whose insistent questions helped bring Guatemalan fascism to its knees and forced the United States to admit its role in a phantom war denied from one administration to the next. Diana survived her deaths and lives in this poem whose reason for being is to let her go in peace. Mm -hmm. This next one is called Waiting Our Turn. Lawrence, he of Lady Chatterley, said the way to eat a fig was open it until it becomes a glittering, rosy, moist, honeyed, four-petaled flower. Then, after raping the blossom, hold it in your mouth, lick the crack and devour the flesh in a single bite. 
every flute has its secret, said the poet who women loved, then turned us into luscious fruits to be peeled by hungry lips and spit out. Neruda, he of communist solidarity, wrote of women's bodies as white hills and white thighs promised to forge us as weapons, arrow to bow, stone in its sling, so he could outlive himself. This poem is my reply, neither seductive fruit to be savored and discarded, nor white in a world of brown, and never, ever weaponized. We sharpen our tongues, imagine our revenge, and wait our turn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your applause, thank you though. Feels good to be clapped at. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd rather have the, the reading take its course. Then at the end, you can really clap if you feel like it. <laughs> so this one is called Way Back When Letters First Snapped Into Focus. Far off in the palm of my hand, my eight-year-old curiosity tries to hide between forefinger and thumb, rides the fleshy pad without complaint, already too late to pretend. Distant, when I close my eyes, dreams of piloting a plane or painting a masterpiece have conceded they won't happen in time to meet the age requirement. Promises I would climb Mount Everest or even hike Grand Canyon rim to rim, left of their own volition years ago, holograms of desire. Way back then or day after tomorrow, when letters first snapped into focus as words, black marks on white pages. It wasn't about wanting to write. I simply knew language caressed and burned me simultaneously, took up deep residence, never gave up, stuck to my foot like a shadow at high noon. That was the easy part. Harder is turning those words into places where people want to live. Questions that ignite the answers fleeing my lips. This one is called No Flag Claiming Possession. Uh, as I grow older, I guess I see that, uh, or I, I feel that nationalisms are one of the most dangerous things that we have to contend with. And of course, we're very aware of that today. So I was calling this somehow about that. In the dream, I felt my synapses dancing, low buzz like a swarm of bees. It was no pain, no edge of waking or migratory threat only wind against time's face. I squatted and laid a small green egg, not flawless or smooth, Thailand or China, but jagged stone from Big Sur, California's raging coast, etching my palm with a map of everywhere. No flagpole on the rock. No flag raised to claim possession. And I knew I could return the stone to its birthplace or hold it within me until we learn to respect the coast, the wind, the bees. This one is yes after no. Calm follows the storm as B follows A. Two trails, one or 
101 follows upon 100 heels in our dangerous calculation of future. Yes after no is something else entirely, a response of your own making as you dodge the sneak attack that will follow you home. Look at her if you dare. If you turn away, you risk falling through the mirror. Yes after no. Something tells me that I just missed. Did I miss the last uh, stanza of that poem? Uh, the last line, yes <laughs> after no, will always be the question. Okay, there you have it. <laughs> well done. I thought I had copied the reading well, but thank you for the help. <laughs> so this one is questions, laughing and dancing. Wise men of old believe we were guided by powers bequeathed by the gods, qualities of lineage and destiny. Then the religious seers decided we had souls, were made of fervor and devotion, conceived and created by an all-knowing deity. The romantics spoke of the heart, love being the essence that fills us with delight, vanquishes all other emotions, fulfills every need. But then the materialists came along. For them, seeing was believing, and reason overrode that faith, nurtured by wishful thinking. Modern science reveals sequences of DNA, telling us we are closer to our animal ancestors than the ignorant or bigoted admit. I say we are made of questions laughing and dancing with answers, puzzles waiting to be solved, a poem or two coursing through our veins. So there's a section, um, I guess you, you, you get it by now that I like being irreverent in my poetry as I do in my life. So there's a uh, section of this book that's called Unwinding Myths. And it's a series of poems um, written about myths from all different cultures, um, not just the, the Greek myths, but um, from Mesoamerica, from Native America um, in North America, from um, the Celtic mythology, from many different cultures. And I'm gonna just read um, one of those poems. It's called, so they're, they're my rewrite of these myths. And the, the one I'm gonna read is called Medusa. <laughs> her hair fanned out from her face, furious snakes writhing in the light of day. Each strand sent a message into space, but the static made them hard to decipher. Boys will be boys, the mortals whined, but the warning came back that looking into Medusa's eyes, would turn you to stone. Why chance it? Perseus thought her head would make a powerful weapon and took it for his arsenal. The eyes still worked, still paralyzed those they gazed upon. Wait, cried those eyes, unblinking. And I'm going to close with the poem that opens the book. Um, for some reason, I, I felt like re reading this poem a lot lately. Um, I think maybe of all the poems in the book, it most closely um, reflects how I'm feeling these days. And it's called About the Light. It's about the light. So you must spend some time in shadow Emerge with your eyes and every pore open to receive the brilliance of landscape without it blinding you. Cold like heat warms our fingertips 
if only by contrast in those places where embodiment cancels the answer that didn't come, the wall that should have had a door in its history of stone. If you explain everything in relation to everything else, you miss what disappears between becoming dust, then rising like a phoenix in your hands. What touches you and what escapes on ultraviolet beams or caresses your brow with gentle music and cool hands is only on loan for as long as you live. After that, it's no longer your problem to solve from first gulp of air to last voice heard. All that busyness that keeps us from the work that matters. Um, thank you. Uh, if you'd like, we can uh, turn this into conversation. I'd love that. Or maybe sure. uh, you want to go in and look at Barbara's pictures uh, or books or have us sign books. Or maybe we can all do that. all of the above. So, yeah. It's